take a risk and ask you, how are the sermons going in your life? I'm not talking to a bunch of pastors. I'm talking to a bunch of people in the congregation. How much do you enjoy listening to a sermon? Now, we pastors are very pompous and say, well, it's the only shot we got. We got them trapped. They got to sit there and listen. So we got them where we want them. Do we? I don't think so. I've come to be convinced that a lot of people, when they come to church, don't know what to do. Why? Because they don't go there often enough. It's kind of like when you go to a new restaurant. Your friends could have told you it's the best restaurant available. It's got the best food, the best chef. It's got everything. But you're new there, and you don't know anything about it, so you're going to experiment and find out if it's good for you. That's kind of like going to church for some people. They don't know what to expect. They don't know the pastor. They don't know anything about the congregation. And they get invited to come. And when you come, the first thing you run into is a sermon. Now, that's great, I think, if it's based upon God's word and enriches our faith. I don't think it's ever possible for sermons to be boring if we stick to the basic truths. At the seminary, we go to a course called homiletics, big name. What they're trying to do there is teach a bunch of fellows how to become preachers. Now, it all depends on who's doing the teaching. I was fortunate when I went to school, we had a great homiletics professor who not only was a good teacher, but more importantly, a great preacher. Sometimes I think people get that job at the seminary because they don't know how to preach. So they get hired to go out and teach other people to do it the right way when maybe they really weren't all that good at it themselves. But this morning we want to study the fact that when Jesus raises up a group of disciples, he had problems in three years of trying to get them to learn the basic fact of forgiveness and forgiving. He tells us in our lesson this morning that things that cause people to sin are bound to happen. They happen all the time. But woe to the person who causes them to happen. You and I know that fact. Maybe you know of something in your life that you said or did or could have said or should have done that caused somebody else to suffer maybe even to sin and feel separated from God and from one another. So Jesus warns us to be careful and to watch out that we don't cause and help other people to sin. Now, most of us have trouble stopping sinning of ourselves, no less to worry about somebody else and make sure they don't do it. But Jesus says it's that important now, the disciples, when they heard that, began to wonder, do you mean to tell me I should forgive somebody seven times in the same day who asked me to forgive them? Jesus said, oh, yeah, if you start out one. If, you, if they sin and they come and say, I repent, please forgive me, see, so you forgive them. But seven times in the same day from the same person? Well, that sounds a little ridiculous. Almost as ridiculous as when Jesus said, if somebody tries to hit you on the right cheek, what should you do? He doesn't say wail them back. He says turn the other cheek and let them take a shot at that one. Or if somebody wants to steal your coat, say hold it just a minute, here's my cloak as well, take everything. That sounds kind of ridiculous in our world. It doesn't sound very proper and it doesn't seem to sound right. But that's what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. And since we're his disciples today, he's trying to teach us still those same messages of forgiveness and how to be forgiving and loving toward other people. When the disciples got to thinking about it, all they could say was, increase our faith. They're saying they knew they were inadequate. 
that they hadn't possibly been paying enough attention and they had so much more to learn before they would feel comfortable in going out in Jesus' name to reach out to their world with the forgiveness of sins. And so you and I feel the same way at times. One of the great songs of the church is, Faith of our fathers living still, in spite of thunder, power, and storm. And then it goes on and lists a whole bunch of stuff that can happen. And when we look back at the Bible, we find certain great people of faith. We think of Abraham, who had enough faith to leave his land and home and go to a land that he didn't even know about because God was directing him to go, even at an old age. Or we can think of Job. We remember his great patience among all the sufferings and trials of life. Wow, what a faith that man had. And then we can remember Daniel, who was put in the fiery furnace and the lions and all that stuff to try to get him to deny the true God that he worshipped and follow the emperor in worship. And he wouldn't do it because he was strong in his faith. He knew his God and he would not be deterred. Or we think of St. Paul in the New Testament when we hear him say, I have kept the faith. Here was a man who really went through some hard times and came out triumphant in faith in God and in his son, Jesus Christ. So as you and I look back over the centuries, we know of outstanding people of faith. And then we come along with our own puny aspects of faith and wonder what we still have to learn. Well, there's not a lot that we have to learn. Because Jesus makes it plain, it's not the quantity of faith that counts, it's the quality of faith. If you have faith, it doesn't mean that you got more than somebody else, but that God in his grace has showered faith upon you so that you personally believe the invitation of God and find joy and peace in believing his message to you. Faith is always based upon the grace of God and not what you or I bring to the opportunity to come to faith. Faith is from start to finish the work of God showered upon us. So when we hear the disciples say, Lord, give us more faith, he comes back and says, if you have the faith of a little tiny mustard seed, which most of us couldn't even see without a magnifying glass, that's all you need. And that's enough faith to remove a mulberry tree and tell it to grow in the ocean. Mulberry trees, I understand, have very intricate roots, and they're pretty hard to dig up. You ever try to transplant something in your yard? You can't even hire people to do it half the time. They don't want to do it. We had a tree in our yard that we wanted to move. We hired the guy, he came with the big fork, put the fork in the ground, pushed the button, and guess what happened? The truck went up in the air. <laughs> we had to hire a bigger machine and pay a lot more money for some fellow to come from Eastern Tree in Southampton to move that tree. The man in Setauka and Stony Brook couldn't do it. So when Jesus said, it's not the quantity of your faith, but the quality that counts. He's trying to pique his disciples' interest so that they're willing to go on again and learn more. So don't think they've arrived, but they're on the way to achieving the goal that he has in mind for them. As we look at our lives then, we want to ask ourselves that the purpose of sermons over the years was to bring us to keep us in faith. And if you remember your confirmation lessons, we say that our faith is knowledge, assent, and confidence. You need to know something, and God provides that in his word. You need to assent to it. That means you need to say, yes, it's for me, and I appreciate his gift. And then you need to have confidence, total trust 
in his invitation that he cares for you enough to send his son to Calvary's cross to rescue you from sin, death, and the power of the devil so that today you and I can gather together around word and sacrament. We've already confessed our sins to one another by simply being here, and we want to know that we are called and gathered and enlightened by God today to celebrate the gift of faith that he has given to us. So faith is defined clearly for us, and it's a powerful force. It can do wonderful things. I read recently about a man who was on his deathbed, and he was restless and agitated, and they said, what's the matter? Why aren't you at peace? He said, well, I've never told anybody, but when I was a little boy, we played in a park. And we played right by the crossroads of town. And it was a sign there that told you which way to go. And being a smart little fellow, I decided to turn the sign. So I turned the sign, and now I've been wondering my whole life, how many people did I send the wrong way? And how did they feel about it when they got there and find out that they were tricked? He felt guilty for his whole life because he did what he thought was a smart move as a wild little kid. In life, we have often pointed people in the wrong way and in the wrong direction, but by God's grace, you and I here at Grace Church have the capacity and the ability to help people learn to know Jesus Christ, to follow him, and to let him be the way the truth and the life and to say to them without apology there's no other way to be right with God than through his gift through Jesus Christ we don't get there by doing a lot of good works although in our gospel today he gives us an example that faith proves itself by what it does he uses an interesting example he says a man who has a laborer out in the field taking care of the crops and the sheep, and it's finally time for the day of work to end, and what happens? Does he say to his laborer, come on in and sit down at the table, we're gonna eat? No. What he says is, you get in here and start cooking my meal. He said, after I eat, then you'll get your chance, but first, you must feed, make sure that I have enough to eat and drink. And then when I'm done, you can cook something for yourself. Sounds like something every wife or mother would understand. Take care of the whole family, and now it's her turn. Jesus says that because it's an illustration that when we do anything in service to God or to man, it's not in order to get merit for ourselves, but it is our duty and our privilege to serve other people. So this morning, when we ask him to increase our faith, we may find the challenge in our lives that our faith is going to lead us to do new and interesting things with people that we maybe have never even met yet, but will come into our lives and be an opportunity to win for Jesus Christ. Look for those opportunities. When I was here some months ago, I had shared with you a quote that I found from Martin Luther. Why it showed up on my computer, I don't know. But I think more and more about it all the time. Martin Luther is said to have said at one point, there comes a time in life when a person must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but you must take that position because your conscience tells you that it's the right position to take. I think we need a lot more people like that in our world, people who know what they believe and where they stand and are willing to stand up and say so, even if it's not popular, powerful, or politically correct, but because you have been informed by God's word and by his grace, 
and you have come to a decision on a particular, particular position, you must speak it because your conscience tells you that it's the right thing to do. I know from my work in the church and in the synod in particular, there were lots of times when I and we as a board of directors had to say some things and do some things that could easily be misunderstood by those who were not as informed or up to speed as we needed to be. But that happens all over the place in life. That happens in school, it happens in church, it happens at the job. So be sure that your mind and your conscience is properly informed by God's word and then take that position and speak up about it. I was happy today to give out another two bumper stickers here at Grace. When I was here previously, I told you that I was giving them out. I was at Trinity Hicksville a few weeks ago, big church. And after church, when I told them about it, I went out to my car, it was 100 degrees in the sun, and here were 29 people lined up waiting for a bumper sticker. Wow, that was great. And when I went back last week, a lady came up to me and said, my bumper sticker is doing really well. I'm getting lots of conversation about Jesus. Well, it says, tell the good news about Jesus. A lady stopped me at our post office last week, said, oh, I kind of like your bumper sticker. I said, well, which one do you like? She said, well, that one right there. She said, you know, we don't talk the gospel enough to one another in our daily lives. At the post office, a woman I never met is starting to tell me about the importance of the gospel in her life. Hey, that's pretty good. It was better than talking about sports or the weather. So when you have the opportunity to share the faith, make sure you do it and give God the glory. This morning then, with the disciples, we still have a lot to learn and hear. And with them, we can say to Jesus, increase our faith. Make sure it's the right faith. And then lead us on to share it to your glory and to the good of our neighbor for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now may that peace of God which passes all human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.